great to be with you all and uh, so glad um, that this is happening and it's just been a pleasure to serve and support uh, Pro Professor Kirk uh, on this journey with the Center for Law and the Human Person. So uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Graw Leary uh, on her talk, It's Expensive to End Slavery, the Need for Forced Labor Laws to Reflect the Value of Human Life. Uh, Professor Graw Leary serves as Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and a Professor of Law here at Catholic University School of Law. Uh, a former prosecutor, she is also a former policy consultant and deputy director for the Office of Legal Counsel at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and a former director of the National Center for the Prosecution of Child Abuse. Professor Graw clerked for the Honorable Sue Robinson at the U.S. District Court for the District of Delaware. Uh, she's chair of the U.S. Sentencing Commission's Victim Advocacy Group and former co-chair of the Victims Group of the ABA's Criminal Justice Section. She has testified before congressional committees and addressed audiences nationally and internationally. She received her BA with honors from Georgetown University and her law degree from Georgetown University Law Center. Her scholarship and extensive publication, it's very impressive, focuses on exploitation and abuse of women, children, and the marginalized. She's recognized as an expert in criminal law and procedure, victimization, exploitation, human trafficking, mixing pursing, technology, and the Fourth Amendment. Uh, please welcome Dr. Professor, or Professor Graw Leary. Thank you. Thank you very much. My colleagues are familiar with the joke I usually tell after that introduction, which is, this is why no one talks to me at the holiday party, right, <laughs> given what I do. I want to thank you very much for uh, inviting me here to talk. I want to thank the Center for Law and the Human Person, Professor Kirk, for all of her work that she's done. It's a real great honor to be here with you for this inaugural conference, and a particularly great honor to be with my fellow speakers, uh, uh, Professor Schiltz, Professor, I, I wrote this out phonetically as I promised him, G Deuteronomy, huh. close, did I get it? All right, excellent. And of course, Professor Sneed. And it's an honor to come and talk to you about what I consider to be the moral issue of our time, modern slavery. And the inflection point at which we find ourselves in our current global movement against it. And make no mistake about it, we are in the midst of a social movement and, in my opinion, we are losing. Now let's get a few things out of the way. I know what you're thinking, like my students, slavery, isn't that a little bit strong, Professor Graw Leary, a little bit dramatic? Well, my answer is no. And I'm in pretty good company if being in company of four, the last four presidents puts you in good company. I suppose it depends where you sit on the aisle. But the last four presidents, the last five secretaries of state, and Pope Francis have tied this concept of human trafficking to modern day slavery and used those labels. Uh, Barack Obama particularly talking about it, calling it by its true name, modern slavery. If you don't like that party, we've got President Bush talking about how we can't allow this slavery to thrive at our time. If you don't like either party, it's always good to go to the clerics with Pope Francis, not only talking about human trafficking as modern slavery, but linking it to this concept of dignity. I'm also correct if, we, if you like the UN instead. The UN who talks about in its uh, most recent report on forced labor and forced marriage, the following. Although modern slavery is not de defined in the law, it is used as an umbrella term covering practices such as forced labor, debt bondage, forced marriage, and human trafficking. It refers to situations of exploitation that a person cannot refuse or leave because of threats of violence, coercion, deception, abuse of power. If you still don't believe me that we're in the midst of modern slavery, let's just think about the size of this problem. The same report tells us at the ILO that we have 49.6 million people, 49.6 million people suffering in conditions of slavery or forced marriage. Uh, Forced labor uh, encompasses 27.6 million of those 
people, and that is my topic today. The numbers are staggering. You can see 12% of them are children, women and girls accounting to 4.9%. So if you think that I am wrong about slavery as a potential label, I would suggest to you the authorities back me up. Similarly, you might say, well, perhaps I'm a bit dramatic about us losing this social m movement. And I would say to you, again, I am not. The same report tells us that forced labor has grown in recent years, an increase of 2.7 million in the number of people in forced labor between 2016 and 2021. More people are enslaved today than were enslaved during the transatlantic slavery. Now, there are more people in the world. I'm not saying they're the same thing. But if you find yourself looking back and wondering, how could anyone have lived through that time and not seen that it was wrong and have done something about it, I suggest to you our grandchildren will ask us the same thing. And are we losing? Well, the ILO and the UN report that this is a $150 billion industry. The Department of Labor issues an annual report of products likely to be made with forced or child labor. And that is 159 products coming from 78 countries. And these are not strange things that perhaps you and I avoid. Let's be clear. Uh, they, I'm glad there's no coffee. That's a good thing because coffee and cocoa are pretty much touched by the hands of forced labor at some point in the, pro, in the process. Fish from Indonesia, bricks from India and Paraguay, Peru, tobacco from Malawi. This is the breadth of forced labor products. And yet, the ILO tells us, Prosecutions are decreasing. Prosecutions decreased 27% since 2019. Now, of course, there's COVID in there, but that is a trend that has been continuing since 2017. Now, I know what you're thinking next. Well, surely not here in the United States. This is something that's abroad, right? This is a, a problem there. And I'm here to tell you, no. That same report from the UN says that forced labor is a concern regardless of a country's wealth. More than half of all forced labor occurs either in upper middle income or high income countries. The Trafficking in Persons report reports that forced labor is well documented in the private economy, particularly in agriculture, fishing, manufacturing, construction, and domestic work, but no sector is immune. And here are just a few of the headlines that I pulled up. These are mainstream companies, mainstream products. Um, if any of you have young uh, people in your lives, you will know that Shein is where everyone wants to shop. Shein, whose workers do 75-hour work weeks, and yet they made $22.7 billion in revenue during COVID. So that's the bad news. Fortunately, that is the bad news. But to summarize it bluntly, today, modern-day slavery is a low-risk, high-reward enterprise. It is criminal and a human rights violation in which many aspects of the private sector engage in throughout the country and the globe with particularly disproportionate effects for women, girls, migrants, and the most vulnerable of people. The good news is there is a vibrant social, global social movement fighting against this. And that's where I want to focus my time today, discussing the state of play in a little bit more detail about modern day slavery and the movement against it, why we are losing, in my opinion, and a potential pathway out of it. And it is here that the role of human dignity is paramount. So a couple of words on social movements. Um, being a good lawyer, I had to look that up, because, look up a good definition, because I think about this a lot in my line of work. Um, I think Professor Brown pointed out all of the areas that I think about, none of which are happy, and I want to know what makes a social movement successful and what does not. And so the best definition I could find, it's a little bit of a layman's definition, no quoting Aquinas here like our previous speaker. This is more for the working class. Ne 
Networks of people or groups in an effort to achieve a specific goal, typically social or political change. And here we're focused on social change and economic change. Some examples, both successful and not, and of course when I say successful, that doesn't mean the entire problem's gone away, for I think we would all agree the civil rights movement in the United States was successful, but there's a lot of work that remains to be done. The same with the women's rights movement, writ large was a success, but I'm still only earning 70 cents to my colleague's dollar. But what, what are some successful movements? Women's suffrage, political. The anti-drunk driving movement, social and legal, something that was, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, something completely socially acceptable and within a few decades made not. Um, the anti-war movement during Vietnam, right? Social and political. But the history is littered with failed social movements. Remember Occupy Wall Street? Those of us in Washington remember the traffic jams, but um, that was a social and economic movement. Remember the movement for democracy in Egypt? The anti-globalization uh, movement, you could essentially say did not succeed. The socialist movement here in the United States reaching its peak in the early 20th century. And so I think a lot about what separates these two? How can we steer to a successful movement? And in my thinking about it, I have, deci I have decided that there are three components to a successful social movement. And you'll see my arrows go back and forth because sometimes the law leads, sometimes it follows these certain things. But essentially, um, I would say the first component, and I have up here an ad campaign from Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And I think it is a really great example of what I'm talking about. So for not many of us in this room, but our parents, there was a time when drinking and driving was a non-issue, was humorous at best, right? There were certainly no breathalyzer laws, presumptions of guilt, or those sorts of things, okay? We live in a very different world today. One key aspect of that was education, but specific education on the harm, the social harm that drunk driving created. And Mothers Against Drunk Driving was the face of that, educating people on what it's like to lose your child, to put those crashed up cars in front of the high schools, changing our concept of drinking in a way that we didn't appreciate before. Then there was a change in laws. Again, sometimes that leads, sometimes it follows, but it's rather extraordinary as a criminal law professor if you think about we have a test given at the side of a road that is a presumption of intoxication. In the criminal law, I can't think of many other situations where that is true, uh, let, uh, et cetera. And then stigma or shame, very old school word, but one thing that they successfully did in this movement was make it not low risk, high reward, right? Make it a social stigma. Make it not okay to reap the benefits of the behavior that we are trying to change. And I think those are real key aspects to successful social movements. But as I've thought about it more, I think there's another thing in this, and that is my horrific graphic of what is supposed to be a dollar sign. Overlaying my triangle is money. Of course, you have to have money to successfully win your social movement. It certainly helps, I would say. But I think as well, what I'm really talking about is overcoming the tremendous forces against a social movement um, because because the other side often has a lot of money. Again, a $150 billion enterprise we are talking about. And often, the fight is not so much about the issue, although it may be framed like that, but what is underlying the opposition to a social movement is the, finan the tremendous financial advantage that the other side has. And while public engagement might be on other issues, the true conflict is driven by the desire to continue to benefit from the behaviors through wide profit margins. 
Okay, so let's talk about the anti-slavery movement. Now, many of you might think, well, did that end? 19th century, didn't that end? But of course, all of us as students of history know it did not, that uh, de facto slavery continued for decades and decades after the Civil War with peonage, a legally enforced debt bondage that relied upon the compliance of local law enforcement and judicial officials sometimes officially, other times informally, to force people into labor. But our current global movement regarding uh, uh, human trafficking and forced labor has really expanded our concepts of slavery to include this idea of force and fraud or coercion. For example, understanding prostitution as sex trafficking seeing a form of forced labor as something between a labor violation, relatively minor, and physically forced slavery. And so here in the United States, we might say a uh, part of this was this case called United States versus Kosminski. And this um, exemplifies what I am talking about. Um, in this particular case, uh, the government brought charges of involuntary servitude. And the facts are, for more than 10 years, two mentally disabled men, um, IQs of 60 or 66 respectively, worked seven days a week, 17 hours a day. At first they got paid $15 a week, but eventually it was for no pay. Um, one of the gentlemen was employed at another dairy farm in upstate New York, and he was picked up at the side of the road by Ms. Kosminski, um, and she physically separated him from his other work. Mr. Molotaris, the second man, was homeless, and she physically picked him up and took him to the farm. They were subjected during these 10 years to physical and verbal abuse for failing to do their work. The other herdsmen were instructed to, uh, 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 instructed to isolate these gentlemen. The Kosminskis told these gentlemen not to leave. And on the few occasions that they did leave, they were brought back and discouraged from leaving again. On, they were, on one occasion, they were threatened to be returned to a mental institution where one of them had resided before. The trailer in which the two lived was described by the court as filthy, having no running water, a broken refrigerator, and maggot-infested food. The court concluded that they were not given adequate nutrition, housing, clothing, or medical care. The Kosminski discouraged relatives and neighbors and other farmhands from interacting with them. I don't know about you, but it sounds like slavery to me. But the Supreme Court so that it was not involuntary servitude, finding that the statute at issue, the involuntary servitude statute, necessarily requires a condition of physical restraint or physical injury and by the, or by the use of a threat of coercion through the law or legal process. That is what the statute covered and these convictions were reversed. And I would submit to you a great example of the law does not match the harm. So where do we go? Tremendous legal change in the year 2000. Here in the United States, somewhat as a result of Kosminski, somewhat as a result of other forces, we have the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Globally, we have the Palermo Protocol, and we have the world really transforming its understanding of human trafficking and modern day slavery. Both advance this concept of human trafficking. We didn't really use this term before the year 2000. And a clear recognition of the exploitation that occurs when you just compel labor or you compel services, not only through physical force, but through other forms, debt bondage, traumatic bonding, fraudulent recruiting, subtle coercion, abuse of the laws, etc. And the best example of this, again, would be our reframing of our concepts of prostitution. Prior to this, Prostitutes was a vice crime, and prostitutes was a label. Now we've transformed our understanding of prostituted people to very often victims of sexual trafficking. And there was once a time where we used the phrase child prostitute, whereas today completely unaccepted, because we understand that all children who are engaged in sexual activity with adults are the victims of child sexual abuse, regardless of whether or not money 
changed hands. And in the labor space, we have an increasing awareness of the use of a child or forced labor, coffee, chocolate, soccer balls your kids play with, carpets you walk on, domestic servitude, that there are minimum standards for every country in the world to combat trafficking. And a key component to this tremendous shift to our understanding of modern day slavery is understanding and the education of the gravity of the social harm. And I would submit to you, baked into that is who these victims are and the recognition by society and the governments of the world that they are indeed deserving of the inherent human dignity. Examples, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act cited the Kosminski case when it was passed in 2000, and it talked about trafficking in persons as, quote, an evil requiring a concerted and vigorous action by countries of origin, transit, and destination, and by international organizations. Here you see in finding number 22 of the TVPA, the, uh, the explicit recognition of the inherent dignity and the worth of all people. Internationally as well, we see in the forward to the Convention of Transnational Crime, which is what the Palermo Protocol is tied to, um, the declaration stating men and women have the right to live their lives and raise their children in dignity, free from hunger, from the fear of violence and oppression. The Council of Europe, their Convention on Human Trafficking, again, invokes this idea of dignity, quote, considering trafficking in human beings constitutes a violation of human rights and an offense to the dignity and integrity of the human being. So where are we today? We're in not a bad place, right? And you could say in some ways, the TVPA has been reauthorized over five times. Every state in the United States, and in my class, I used to have to say except Wyoming, but now even Wyoming has a trafficking law. 180 countries have ratified the Palermo Protocol. We've seen tremendous social change, a movement for the equality model in sex trafficking, where we actually hold the buyer of another human being responsible, not the person being bought. The uh, Sustainable Development Goal Target 8.7 calls on all countries to take immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor and modern slavery. And we've got these apps where you can go on and be a good consumer and try to figure out if the product you're interested in is a clean supply chain or not. Or you can go, not now, to myslaveryfootprint.com and plug in the information about how you live your life and see how many slaves you employ employ. Great. And yet, the trafficking in person report tells us this continues to grow. In 2022, the TIP report, which comes out every year, uh, includes not only 22 countries on tier three, meaning countries whose governments do not fully meet the TVPA's minimum standards and are not making any significant efforts to do so, but this year, 11 countries who are involved in state-sponsored Trafficking. Government endorsed state sponsored trafficking. The TIP report does report, and their report, that uh, prosecutions are up from last year, but they are actually half of what they were at their height in 2015. As I said, globally, there were 5,260 convictions in 2021. 374 of them for labor trafficking. Now, I'm not great at math being a lawyer, but I can see that there's a big gap between 20 something million and 364. So where are we now? On the one hand, awareness is up. Um, and on the other hand, effective interruption is down. This remains a high reward, low risk proposition I would submit to you there is no or little shame in labor trafficking in your supply chains. And we sit here, all of us, knowing the coffee we drink, the chocolate we eat, the carpet we walk on, the phone to which, into which we speak, are all likely to have been touched by the hands of someone subjected to forced labor. In short, thanks to the TVPA and the Palermo Protocol, we've got the criminal laws but now we have to move to what I call anti-trafficking 2.0. Now we have to enact laws or make changes that are gonna hurt. It's kind of easy to make a lot of things illegal and that's a good thing, that's really important. But now it's gonna hurt. 
It's going to hurt the consumer to pay more. It's going to hurt the company to lose profits. It's going to hurt the government to provide the kind of services that are needed. And how do I know that we're losing this battle? Well, I'm in, I'm in a crowd of academics. I know you all saw this story. The New York Times recently did what I predict will be a Pulitzer Prize winning expose about migrant children being exploited in the United States in industrial level jobs. Their findings included tens of thousands of children come to the border where they're rapidly processed to a sponsor, quote unquote, under the guise that they will attend school and be protected. But then they are put to work in industrial jobs, roofing, making Cheerios and granola bars, etc. Migrant child labor um, benefits both under the table operations and global corporations. The Times found in Los Angeles, children stitch Made in America tags for, into J. Crew shirts. They bake dinner rolls that are sold at Walmart and Target. They process milk used in Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and they help to bone chicken that is sold at Whole Foods. As recently as this fall, middle schoolers were, ma were um, found making Fruit of the Loom socks in Alabama, and in Michigan, they were making auto, pots, uh, auto parts used by Ford and General Motors. Okay, well maybe those are just some bad actors, but what's happening in the law? At the same time, several states are moving to increase the ability to hire children for industrial jobs. In Iowa, there's a proposal that would expand the hours teenagers can work during the school year and shield businesses from civil liability if a youth worker is sickened, injured, or killed on the job. In Wisconsin, such legislation passed only to be vetoed by the governor. In Minnesota, their bill seeks to allow 16 or 17 year olds to perform construction. And I just got the news story today. In Arkansas, they passed the Youth Hiring Act of 2023, just a few days ago, and that eliminates state age verification for children less than 16 and no parental permission is required to work. And why? Well, it's a tight labor market is what we are told. A tight labor market to have children working in dangerous industrial jobs. Well, that was shocking. Those of you who may have seen the story might have been horrified, shocked. This is terrible. Surely this will be the stuff that will pivot our social movement to end trafficking. But sadly, that is not the case. Earlier in 2022, Reuters reported that JBS settled a case in which 13 and 14 year olds were working in a slaughterhouses, 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. in what was called oppressive working conditions. The penalty that ultimately had to be paid $15,138 for each illegally employed child. Also, but it goes back beyond that. In 2015, Human Rights Watch exposed a massive child labor in the tobacco industry. Yes, we live in a country where it's too dangerous for children to smoke, but it's not too dangerous for them to inhale what is the equivalent of over a dozen cigarettes during their work day. Um, Similarly, Frontline did an expose uh, on other forms of child labor as well. In fact, uh, and, excuse me, and in fact, uh, in case you think this didn't spark any action, it did spark action. There were congressional hearings back in 2016 on, look at this, unaccompanied alien children coming in and being forced to work in industrial jobs. And this report that was produced said, quote, over a period of four months in 2014, HHS allegedly placed a number of unaccompanied children in the hands of a ring of human traffickers who forced them to work on egg farms and around the Marion, Ohio area, leading to federal criminal indictment. According to the indictment, the minor children were forced to work six or seven days a week 12 hours a day, um, and they were threatened with physical harm, their family's physical harm, or even death if they did not work and surrender their entire paychecks. In the 400 pages of hearing testimony, the word dignity is nowhere to be found. Why? Why is this happening? 
Well, I would suggest you we go back to my triangle, even with its bad graphic. Go back to my triangle. There is no stigma. There is, it's, this is Cheerios, Ralph Lauren, JBS. They're taking advantage of vulnerable people, not because there's a tight labor market, but it is a cost-saving measure. There are not the laws in place to stop this. The Fair Labor Standards Act does not apply to the agriculture. Child labor laws have many loopholes, and when they do not, even if they do not have loopholes, they're rarely enforced, and now we even have some states repealing them. Education, where is the education about the burns these children experienced in these, work, in these workplaces, the death of roofers, the reality of children pressured to send money home so that their families will survive, so that they can pay their debts and avoid injury. This is a global corporate interest, and it is in the global corporate interest to hide behind the supply chains and say they're very complex and it's not us, it's our subcontractor, subcontractor, subcontractor. And I would submit to you that we are at a point of inflection here. We're at a point of inflection, what I call human trafficking 2.0. As I said, we have the laws, but the question is, are we going to take that next step in social movements where it will hurt? It will cost businesses who can no longer hide behind supply chains. It will cost our government to spend more on true regulation, on inspectors, on HHS social workers to monitor children, pay more for solar panels and PPE, regulate entities. It'll cost us. We'll have to pay more for all of these products. And these will make difficult decisions. Some of these t-shirts sold at some of these stores are a way that low-income families can clothe their children. How do we navigate these difficult concepts? And the question is, will we do it? And in my opinion, the answer lies in whether or not we will re-inject into the discourse the social harm. We will educate ourselves and the public again and again on the human dignity of these victims and on what they experience. But there's hope, and here's my hope. I think that that is the solution. And I think in our study at the Bikita Initiative for the study and disruption of human trafficking and modern day slavery, we're seeing hope. Let me explain what I mean. If you look at supply chain laws around the globe, we're seeing a shift. We start in 2010 with the California Supply Chain Transparency Act. Um, it, it was a big deal and it wasn't a big deal. It was kind of a big deal because it's the first time that we saw any government saying, let's look at supply chains. But all it required companies of a certain size to do was to put in a prominent location on their website what they were doing to prevent forced labor in their supply chains. And you would be in complete compliance with this law if you wrote, we're not doing anything and we don't care. But you would have at least had to put it there. And the thinking there was, well, consumers will find this information and they will vote with their pocketbooks, which did not happen. But then we see in 2018 in the Australian Modern Slavery Act, and I should mention, excuse me, in the California Act, no mention of human dignity. The focus was very much in that legislation on the company, not on the social harm. So in the Australian Moder Modern Slavery Act of 2018, also what I would call a disclosure model, it has a little bit more teeth though. It requires people to disclose much more information. There's a government that they have to register, as a government agency, they have to register their report. There are sanctions if they do not comply, and they're held very publicly out if they don't comply. So that shame element we see sort of percolating up. And in the explanatory memo for this piece of legislation, the Australian said modern slavery is fundamentally concerned with exploitation. It robs people of their dignity. But we're really seeing a change more recently, a shift from this disclosure model to what we call the diligence model. Now it started in Germany with the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act, and I don't see dignity in that language I also don't know German, but soon to follow, though, uh, was the European version of that. And this requires global corporations not to disclose, right, but to certify, 
their due diligence in keeping their supply chains clean. And there are ramifications for these global companies if they don't do it. And, all, um, and the EU uh, version of this talks in 2021 when the EU president in her um, State of the Union was announcing the beginning of this process. She said as follows, states, quote, doing business around, excuse me, doing business around the world, global trade, all that is good and necessary, but this can never be done at the expense of people's dignity and freedom. And the EU's proposed directive on corporate sustainability, we see language about um, in the preamble about the respect for human dignity. And the directive itself talks about the loss of human dignity as a form of as a as a form of damages suffered by victim survivors. And in the companion regulation prohibiting products made with forced labor, we see them refer to forced labor as in direct opposition to the respect for dignity. Here in the United States, in the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which passed this past December, in a rare bipartisan legislation, one person voted against it. Um, it, uh, uh, it. There's a presumption, as many of you know, that products from Xinjiang province are made with forced labor, and they're not admissible in the United States unless the importer can overcome that presumption. And it explicitly states it is the policy of the United States, quote, to actively work to prevent, publicly denounce, shame, and end human trafficking as a horrific assault on human dignity and to restore the lives of those affected by human trafficking, a modern form of slavery. Now it's been a long time you've listened to me drone on, and I know really now what you're thinking. And you're like, that sounds all well and good, but that's semantics, really. Dignity, it's like hope. Who's really against it? They just throw these, language, these words in here. But having studied all these statutes, I would suggest to you that there's something substantive here. We are seeing in our research um, a, that the transformative laws that jumpstart this social movement are grounded in this idea of human dignity, are focused on the victims and the social harm. By doing so, they're increasing this awareness of the social harm experienced by the victims because in part, we can identify with these people and we cannot accept their exploitation as simply a cost of doing business. This connection between the harm to person and basic human dignity and the low risk, high reward reality will lead in my view to a change because it stigmatizes those who benefit from this kind of social harm. In short, we already know that it's expensive not to have products made by slaves and children. This, this idea of invoking the dignity into our discussion explains why it is worth the cost. And the laws that reflect this con connection are the most impactful. Secretary Blinken's quote here in this year's Trafficking in Persons report, I think really is the best example of what I'm talking about. You see this connection between accountability for those who benefit from it and the human dignity and felt by the victim survivors of human trafficking. So in conclusion, it's not all bad, but we are at an inflection point. History will judge our current moment as either one of elevation of the human person or the continued exploitation of the most vulnerable as simply a cost of doing business. And for us to continue the momentum of this movement to end modern day slavery, we must continue to educate as to the social harm as an essential component of our movement and of underscoring and elevating that those harmed as human beings are human beings with dignity. And this must be, as the United States Congress stated, they must be free from assault or as the European Union stated, human dignity can never be a cost of doing business around the world. And this is a challenge because there's a great deal of money 
pushing against this piece of the argument, hiding behind the supply chains, claims that the economy will fail, our agricultural system will fall apart, fighting against the diligence model, which actually has penalties, fighting against the Fair Labor Standard Act applying to agriculture, fighting against child labor laws, which have been in existence since the 1930s. But when met with the reminder that all of those affected by this form of exploitation have inherent human dignity just like us and clear descriptions of the harms that they are subjected to, the movement to move the law to a place of accountability, I am hopeful, will continue. I welcome your thoughts. Thank you very much.